Beloved Mother Mary, Archangel Raphael, Mighty I Am Presence, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, open our hearts to receive thy sacred heart in this hour. O mighty I Am Presence, descend. Enter now this temple of the living God. O soul of mine, ascend to the Holy of Holies, my Christ, thy Christ. O thou universal one, thou Lord Krishna, through thy heart, Padma Sambhava, we celebrate the union of Jesus Christ, Lord Maitreya, Gautama Buddha, Sanat Kumara. Let the light of the everlasting sun descend. Let the magnet of the great central sun draw to us now. Life and life begetting life. Draw to us now the great central sun magnet to demagnetize from us and our planetary home the forces of death and hell, disease, decay, and disintegration. Astraea, lock your cosmic circle and sword of blue flame around us. Let the full power of the great central sun now be the fire enfolding itself above and in the center of each one, O God. Let thy flaming swords, O seven archangels, cut free all life, a borning in the wombs of women upon earth in this hour. Cut them free, O Divine Mother. O Blessed Virgin, come forth now in this hour. Let thy light supreme reign within us, above us, beneath to the right, to the left, in the center of our forms. O light, 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 take dominion now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our healing service and our lecture on the right of life to be, on life begetting life. In the great hope of universal life for all, let us sing to the Archei Hope, Wings of Hope, number 291. Thank you. 
Let us sing to Archangel Raphael, number 292. Please make your calls to Archangel Raphael. Please be seated. You can take out your notebooks if you like. What does the child feel during an abortion? There is ongoing debate as to whether or not a fetus feels pain. This is a difficult question to answer. But before we enter the debate, let us point out one singular omission. It is the question as to whether or not the soul feels pain. Let me first give you the medical view. Until recently, it was thought that the fetus and the newborn were not capable of feeling pain. Pain is usually described as a subjective phenomenon. This makes the evaluation of pain in the unborn difficult. Early studies of neurologic development concluded that the fetus could not feel pain. Some researchers argued on a theoretical basis that the fetus has a high pain threshold. This adaptation would protect them from the pain experienced during birth. These traditional views have led to a widespread belief in the medical community that the human fetus may not be capable of perceiving pain. 
Newborns are frequently not given anesthesia during surgery on the presumption that the newborn or premature infant cannot feel pain. Local anesthesia is not used during most circumcisions for the same reason. More recent research weighs heavily in favor of the fetus feeling pain. It is difficult to say categorically at what stage of development the fetus feels pain. Some pro-life literature states that the fetus feels pain by the eighth week of gestation. Dr. Watson Bowes, professor of maternal and fetal medicine at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, says it is hard to prove or disprove whether the fetus feels pain at eight weeks. He says the fetus at that stage is quite responsive. But what is pain? Pain's a complicated thing, and it involves a lot of very complicated primitive reflexes, as well as the perception of it. Fear and anticipation are involved in pain. It's hard to know how complicated the fetus is in that sense. Through ultrasound, we can observe the behavior of a 15-week-old fetus and his response to a painful stimulus. The fetus jumps, moves, and tucks his legs up in a response that is classically like the response of people who are being hurt. Although the evidence is not conclusive that the fetus can feel pain, there are indications that pain receptors are present to some extent at eight weeks. During the seventh week, sensory receptors in the skin are present around the mouth. By the eleventh week, they have spread to the rest of the face, the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. By the fifteenth week, the receptors have reached the trunk and upper parts of the arms and legs. By the twentieth week, pain receptors are found in all the skin and mucous sur surfaces. In 1980, a book called The Development of the Brain said that the first detectable brain activity in response to pain occurs in the thalamus between the ninth and tenth weeks. The thalamus is the relay station for sensory information. Development of the fetal neocortex begins at eight weeks of gestation, but the neural connection between the thalamus and the neocortex does not occur until between 20 and 24 weeks. In a 1987 study, researchers used electron microscopy and other methods to show that the development of various types of cells in the spinal cord begins before 13 to 14 weeks of gestation and is completed by 30 weeks. Researchers have also studied the development of neurochemical systems associated with pain perception. A neurotransmitter called substance P has been shown to play a role in the transmission and control of pain impulses. At 12 to 16 weeks, neural elements containing substance P and its receptors appear in the fetus. Studies have also measured the presence of endorphins in the fetus. Endorphins are proteins released by the pituitary gland in response to pain. They act as the body's natural pain killers. Researchers have found that functionally mature endorphin-producing cells are present in the fetal pituitary gland at 15 weeks and possibly earlier. The evidence indicating that the fetus feels pain by 20 weeks is more conclusive. By 20 weeks, the fetal cortex has its full complement of neurons. The neural connections between the pain receptors and the neocortex are finally established between 20 and 24 weeks. A paper called Pain and Its Effects in the Human Neonate and Fetus by Dr. P. R. Hickey and K. J. S. Anand concludes, numerous lines of evidence suggest that even in the human fetus, pain pathways as well as cortical and subcortical centers necessary for pain perception are well developed late in gestation. 
and the neurochemical systems now known to be associated with pain transmission and modulation are intact and functional, end of quote. The authors say it has not been demonstrated whether the activity of pain receptors and associated responses are felt by the fetus as pain similar to that experienced by older children and adults. However, they say the evidence does show that marked pain receptor activity clearly constitutes a physiologic and perhaps even a psychological form of stress in premature or full-term newborns. We can conclude from the medical evidence that the unborn child may feel pain as early as seven weeks and that he or she definitely feels pain at five to six months. Although the medical evidence is not conclusive, the evidence of our own experience is. One has only to look at the way the 12-week fetus struggles to avoid the suction tip during the suction abortion shown in the silent scream to conclude that the first trimester fetus both fears and feels pain. Someday science will catch up. It won't be the first time that science has lagged behind common sense. Now we come to the question as to whether the soul feels pain. Because I believe in reincarnation and in the continuity of being, because I know that we retain our faculties of cognition and recognition from one lifetime to the next, I am agonizingly aware of what the soul goes through during an abortion. In addition to your physical body, you have a memory body, a mental body, and a desire body. You bring these vehicles of consciousness with you. They have been with you since you went forth from God into the matter universe. Your soul enters the physical body at the moment of conception. Your spirit with your memory, mind, and desire bodies mesh with your physical body day by day until birth. Throughout the nine months of gestation, the soul can come and go at will to and from the body. Each time the soul enters the body, she anchors more of her soul substance in the body. As gestation progresses, the spirit or the essence of the life stream becomes a part of the blood and the cells, a part of the brain, the heart, and all of the organs. When Mary was carrying Jesus, his soul was in the octaves of light and the retreats of the great white brotherhood about half of the time. Alternately, he occupied his body forming in her womb. This was necessary in order for his soul and his spirit to integrate with his four lower bodies. At the hour of Jesus' birth, on spring equinox, he entered his body for the final time. The Son of God descended from the heights of his causal body, and I am presence, depicted as the concentric spheres of light surrounding the Father figure on the chart behind me. He descended with the cry, Lo, I am come to do thy will, O God. Thus he sealed the fiat of his will, the desire of his soul, and the determination of his mind to fulfill his reason for being. Christ was born, the word was made flesh, and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The story of Jesus' birth is the story of your birth. You also were there at the moment of conception, a participant through the Holy Spirit with your father and your mother, all conspiring together that you should come forth according to the will of God. 
And so you were at liberty to come and go in and out of that body being formed, to go into octaves of light and to return again, doing the same as Jesus did, leaving more and more of your soul substance within that body, within the mind and memory, within the point of cognition. Your spirit also entered the body, entering the cells and the blood vessels. Therefore, we are a part of that which is being formed. It is our home from that very moment. The genes have been selected. That single cell fertilized, that ovum, already now has by the divine design everything you need in it, descending from the genes of your parents and their parents, what you must bring forth in this life from your causal body, from your I am presence, to fulfill your reason for being. Jesus was the way shower. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When you descended into form, you could also repeat as the Son of God said, Lo, I am come to do thy will, O God. The soul that occupies first the embryo, then the fetus, then the full-term baby in the womb has awareness. This awareness is called soul or solar awareness. The soul has sensitivity through the spiritual senses, five spiritual senses to be exact. These correspond to your five physical senses. These spiritual senses are what give some people a heightened psychic or soul sensitivity. Everyone has these, but not everyone develops them. When they do, it is said that they are psychic, or they are intuitive, or they have a sixth sense. These senses give you a direct soul knowledge of events and circumstances, even a precognition of what is to come. But they do not function entirely independently of the five senses, the brain, the physical heart, or the central nervous system, because we are an integrated personality in God before, during, and after the nine months that we occupy our mother's womb. The question then of when the fetus feels pain cannot be answered without the understanding that the soul, the spirit, the memory, mind, and desires are experiencing life in all its multifaceted dimensions in and through the physical body as well as independently of it. Whether or not sensory nerves are fully developed and functioning in the fetus is not the determining factor. The determining factor is to be discovered in the sum of the parts and not in the parts taken alone or one by one. Sensory perception and extrasensory perception go hand in hand. The fetus and the soul through and in the fetus are experiencing life as a complex whole, a complex whole that is made in the image and likeness of God. Pain is an all-pervasive and an all-consuming experience. It is the person, the soul, the mind, the being, and yes, the body, as one individual whole, who is fully aware of pain and pleasure. Yes, in the womb. You sucked your thumb in your mother's womb as early as nine weeks. We can prove it today by ultrasound. Why would you suck your thumb if you didn't derive gratification from sucking your thumb? Why would you suck your thumb if you didn't have a physical and an emotional need to do so? And how do you know you didn't also have a psychological and spiritual need to suck your thumb? Therefore, we ask the question, in what dimensions of being do pain and pleasure begin and end? If you can't answer these questions, and I know that I can't, then you and I should leave it to the Almighty 
to work the miracle of life within the womb of creation, the highest gift of God, which he gave to woman. You don't know where you came from before you entered this mortal coil of existence, and you don't know where you'll be going after you exit it. So why do you think you have all the answers about what a baby senses and feels and thinks and does during the nine months in the womb. If you haven't probed the sacred mysteries of the life that is God, the life that is God begetting the life that is in the child, then how can you bestow the power upon physical science in its narrow spectrum to solve the ultimate equation of life and death? How can you depend on physical science alone for the answers when life in all of its splendor tells you there is so much, much more to living than the physical form, which is subject to disintegration and decay from the moment it is created? Just as the soul of the child in the womb comes and goes during gestation, so your soul journeys to higher octaves, etheric octaves, while you sleep. But during your soul travel, a portion of your soul substance, for want of a better word, remains with the body, for it is meshed with the mind, the cells, the organs. This explains why when you are abruptly awakened in the middle of the night, you're a bit groggy at first, and then you become more and more focused as your soul fully re-enters. If you were violently murdered during sleep and your soul was in another plane, you would still experience intense physical and emotional trauma through all of your faculties, including in your spirit and in your soul. Is the child in the womb any different? Absolutely not. The offspring of humans is human from the start. And humans are complete and multidimensional. What may be lacking in fetal development is not lacking in the soul awareness of the mature son or daughter of God who is reincarnating to take up his or her next assignment on planet Earth. Since the soul goes through a process of meshing with the body during gestation, you may be wondering, as a corollary, how quickly the soul disengages from the body at the hour of transition called death. The soul does not exit the body as quickly as people think. This is why the ascended masters teach that the body should be placed on dry ice for 72 hours and then cremated. The prayers of loved ones and the minister, priest, or rabbi during the 72 hours following death are for the purpose of demagnetizing the light from the body and the soul consciousness from the body and severing the soul's emotional ties to the body. If the body is cremated any sooner than in 72 hours, the soul may not have entirely withdrawn from the body and it may suffer in the cremation fires. The ascended masters do not suggest embalming and autopsy, except in cases suspected of foul play or where the family has a specific need to know the cause of the death of a loved one. The reason for this is that the light of the soul, or the spirit's essence, is in the blood. When the body is embalmed, the blood is removed and the embalming fluid is inserted in its place for preservation purposes. The ascended masters teach that the person's every cell which has meshed with the soul must be returned to God through the fire element. Embalming removes billions of blood cells and autopsy disturbs the organs and other billions of cells and interferes somewhat in the disengaging process. Think of how attached people get to their family home 
where generations have lived and died with all of the heirlooms and memories it holds. Just as we can be very much a part of our home, so we can be very much a part of our body. Often people who die don't leave their houses. They stay in the astral plane. You'll find them there 10 years later, sitting in that old rocking chair where they always sat. Likewise, people do not easily leave their bodies. Then there is the case of souls who are suddenly taken from the screen of life, as in an automobile accident. They are abruptly thrust out of their bodies, and they find themselves apart from it, on the road or hovering over it. They may try to get back into their bodies. They don't even realize that they are dead, that they have passed on. They get in the car and try to start it, and they find they can't work through their bodies anymore. So these souls will hover near their bodies with considerable distress. I have seen as I have given prayers for souls in such circumstances that they may be near the scene of the accident months after that accident has taken place. They are stunned, and moreover, they do not know how to navigate. They do not know how to move without a physical body. And so they are waiting for help, intercessory help, from the spiritual realms. If the prayers and the intercessory spiritual work have been accomplished by the time 72 hours have passed, the soul should be disintegrated from the body, enveloped in light, and prepared for the angels who come to take the soul to her place of rest, restoration, and preparation for her next assignment on the earth or on the inner planes. So the difference between the body in the womb and the body at death is that in death, the animating spirit of life, the spirit essence that is actually in the blood and in the cells, is no longer there. By definition, the spirit and the soul occupy a living body. By definition, a fertilized egg is a living body of a spirit and a soul of God ordained to life on earth. The moment the egg is fertilized, the vital essence of the spirit is growing with that cell and the soul is attached to it. The abortion of a body, a spirit and a soul, one in the womb, is a violence unutterable against God. And it is suffered in silent crucifixion. O oh, America, as I live, I know that the child you abort every 20 seconds suffers the most horrible death, just as you and I would if we were mugged in Central Park, knifed and cut up in pieces. But because the child's scream is a silent scream, we can silence the voice of conscience who yet commands, thou shalt not kill. How much more then do we silence the Holy Spirit itself, which, as Paul said, beareth witness with our spirit that we, hence our offspring, are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If you accept the reality of a spiritual as well as a physical lineage and believe that we are descendants of the Father and the Son, as the Bible says, then how can you deny life to the Father and the Son in your child? How can you kill God, helpless God, a borning in your womb? He who destroys his issue is in reality destroying God, God who is the source of that issue. For the creator is in his creation, even as the artist is in his painting. As the source of the stream flows with the stream, so that life who begets life is in that life. The soul of the child who goes through the mayhem of an abortion is scarred. 
scarred not only physically, but emotionally and psychologically. Sometimes, somewhere, those scars must be healed by the healing angels who bear the soul, bruised and beaten to temples of light. I hear the agony of a soul after an abortion and millions of souls still traumatized, still wailing, still sobbing, not alone for pain in all their members and anguish of spirit, but out of a sense of cosmic injustice that their mission in life has been aborted. And what of the pain of the parents? When the abortionist's knife descends, it is also plunged into the heart of the mother and the father. As it is written, and a sword shall pierce thine own heart also. Every mother who chooses abortion is killing a part of herself. Every father who chooses abortion is killing a part of himself. Abortionists are killing father and mother in increments, killing their sensitivity to life. And they are killing the child piecemeal. For that cosmic egg, that cosmic seed, and that cosmic timetable will never again be duplicated. To murder your unborn is to murder a part of yourself that is yet unborn, a part of yourself that will not be realized or fulfilled except through the fruition of those genes that exist in you as human and, yes, God potential. O oh, women of America, mothers of the universe, if you do not want your children, please, please love them to term and give birth to them in the joy of your Lord, who has made you a co-creator with him. Then give them for adoption to those who will love them and provide them with the opportunity to once more live and laugh and play and sing and work together with their playmates on earth to fulfill their reason for being. As you value your life, won't you and the one whose love you shared in this conception dare to know the awesomeness of the life of the soul aborning within you, this wonder of creation who is now flesh of your flesh and bone of your bones. Will you not spare the life that is yours in your child and thereby preserve yourself and your posterity for a golden age to be? A little child shall lead them, the eye so meek and mild. A little child shall feed them. Where is the little child? Right within you, golden man, his flaming image flashes, expanding now as son of man, meteoric flashes. The way ye know, the way to go, reveals in sudden flashes that to live you must forgive Man for sodden clashes. Victory's gleam will send a stream, renewing each man's portion. The dead shall rise unto the skies and live in purest thought. This life is real and will not steal the truth that I have brought. My word abiding now is hiding in the soul that God hath wrought. This little child, so meek and mild, is man whom God hath taught. 
This concludes my message on the child for this evening.